Hey yo, it's Dave Isaacs coming to you from the Guitar Studio on Music Row here in Nashville, Tennessee. And this video is the next in the Essential Songs series. And like all of the song lessons that I'm doing in this series, it's not meant to be an exact transcription of what was played. It's meant to give you an idea of the structure of the song, the basic techniques that are being used, and a good foundation that you can build on as you go to get more specific and really learn the parts as they were recorded and performed. So today, I want to get into Johnny Cash's Folsom Prison Blues, which is, as the title suggests, basically a 12-bar blues, except for the most part, it's really an 11-bar form because it's missing the 12th bar pretty much every time it comes around. The original recording is in the key of F, so you can capo the first fret if you like. I'm going to play it in E, as many people do. And we think of this song as having a train beat. That's the way lots of people would describe it, and I would agree. But the basic strum that you hear when you listen to the recording is something like this. Now you can hear that train. The only difference is really that a train beat implies steady one e and a two e and a one e and a. In other words, constant motion. And in this case, we're leaving a little space. It's more like this: one and a two e and a one and a two e and a one and a two e and a one and a two e and a. So a couple of things to notice here: I am bringing out bass notes the low E string to start, strumming with essentially a simple arm swing, rotation of the forearm. In other words, when I say simple arm swing, I'm talking about this movement as distinct from a full arm swing. They're both legitimate techniques, they just produce two different sounds. The full arm swing is louder. When I say full arm swing, I mean moving the entire arm from fingertips to elbow. It creates a louder sound, and it's really useful for bringing out a backbeat, say. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But that's not so much what we're doing. What we want is to be able to be a little bit more nimble. In general, and this is a generalization, it's not going to apply in every single situation, but it often does, that when you're playing 16th note rhythms, you're going to tend to use more the forearm and wrist than you are the full arm. Just because using the full arm is just a little bit awkward, this is essentially a blunt instrument, it's harder to be precise, and if I try to strum this rhythm using the entire arm, it's just a little clunky. as opposed to that's got more of a swing to it and I don't mean swing in the sense of dump da dump da dump da dump da dump but swing in the sense of a lightness and a flow and sense of movement now let's take a look at this we have the individual note the low E string very very small movement and you want to keep in mind that when you're trying to differentiate between single notes partial chords and full louder chords, the difference is really in how much you move the strumming hand, and specifically how much ground or how much, how much distance the pick covers. To play a single note, that's really all we need. Essentially just dipping the thumb towards the floor. The chord stroke is essentially a swing of the arm and a rotation of the hand. So it's like I'm moving this way. Now it's not a dramatic rotation, but it's not that far from what you would do to turn a doorknob. You just wouldn't move as much. So in fact if I rotate a little bit so you can see the angle, and notice also that it's not strictly a wrist movement,
Notice that doesn't sound all that good either. The wrist alone is great for when we're muting. And there are details of this song to get into. We'll touch on that later. But in terms of this ringing rhythm that we want to just drive things forward, we're talking about, as I said, this small rotation. And if you were to draw a picture of the arc of the pick, the movement of the tip of the pick, it would be essentially a very shallow semicircle that starts above the strings over here and then comes down and ends just below. You could also think of it as being a little bit more of a straight down movement on this side and then turning outward. So we don't need to dramatically turn the hand. So a good way to practice this if you're not comfortable with it, if it's not familiar, is just simply to play a single downstroke, leading with the fingertips and making sure that your arm follows the movement of the tip of the fingers. Now, to distinguish, this would be just moving the arm with the rigid wrist. Louder sound, for sure, but not the right sound. So if you start, for example, with the pick touching the sixth string, and just small movement of the arm, swinging through the strings, and you're really aiming for a point over here. And again, I'll rotate a little bit so you can see from this angle. Now, notice the distinction between the single note and the chord. Now to get more specific, sometimes I'm covering all the way across to the trebles. Sometimes I'm staying more in the middle. I mentioned the backbeat earlier. One, and, two, and, one, and, two, and. Now we could count this as eighth notes as well. One, and two, and three, and four, and one. But because I really feel this song, and I believe you should too, in two. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. I think it makes sense then to count the subdivisions as sixteenth notes. So again, looking at the subtleties of this now, I am essentially alternating a bass note between the sixth string and more or less the fifth string. I'm not worrying about being exactly precise, but I am looking to hear a difference between the downbeat and the beat in the middle of the bar. So we get a sense of alternating bass. Listen for that, and it's part of the entire strum. Now, in order to have the precision to bring out those two different notes, you have to have a good amount of control of your picking hand. But keep in mind, the movements are small. And as you practice this, remember, the strings are going to stay the same distance apart, so you can get a sense after a while, just by feel, of what it takes to move from one to the other. Now, of course, we have strums in between, though. this. I'm playing down, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, up. Each upstroke is going to set up the downstroke that follows. Watch. Down, down, up. So I've come back up and now my hand is essentially over the A string so I can hit that fifth string note. And then this is a little tricky for some people. It may take some getting used to, but I'm going to play the note but continue to move my hand so that I can play an upstroke after I play the single note, like this. Single note, hand moves down, strum up and down. The upstrum is a very small rotation of the hand back to where we started. Think of down up as being two parts of the same movement. 
or like an in-breath and an out-breath. Down, up. It might be worthwhile to practice starting with the up strum. Just a slight turn. Again, let me rotate so you can see this. Like that. So try practicing that. Also try down, up, down, down, up, down. And just noticing the distance that the pick covers for each stroke. So, in slow motion, notice the difference between the accented backbeat, where I'm covering all the strings, and where I'm hitting more the middle strings. Down, accent, up, up, down, up. So here's the backbeat. speed so you can definitely hear that if I mute the strings you can hear that very clearly So essentially we have three different techniques here. The single note, the swing strum, and the smaller brush across the middle. One and a two E and a one and a two E and a. I should mention that when you follow a single note with an upstroke, Sometimes, you don't have to be so precise, sometimes you might end up just doing something like this. Where essentially you're hitting the same strings with the downstroke and the upstroke, but the movement is so small that we just brush the middle of the guitar. But we do want to make an effort to differentiate that bass note from the upstrum on the chord. So once again, here's slow. faster. You'll notice when I pick up speed that we hear a little bit more that sound and a little less. Just because I want the momentum, the movement, more so than I need the, the precision, the specific separation of this bass note from this chord. We need to feel Now, if those subtleties are difficult for you, you really could just That would be more of a beginner way to do it, just down, down, up, down, up, down, up. And practice keeping that wrist light, letting the forearm turn a little. See how fluid that is. And taking care not to play too loud, or it just becomes brash, it doesn't sound good. But as you play with that, just experiment with how much you move and how many strings you hit, and I think those subtleties will start to come out. Again, the idea is not to worry about duplicating the sound perfectly. The idea is to learn the technique, be able to put the song across with the right basic feel, and to have some of what's going on in there, A, to make it recognizable as Folsom Prison Blues, and to begin to get into some of those deeper details that we'll begin to explore a little bit later on. I'm going to follow this up with a subsequent video that's going to look into the electric guitar parts and the very, very cool guitar solo. Okay, so here's the structure of the song. As I said, it's a 12-bar blues with a missing bar, so it's really 11 bars except that we start with the intro, and this is played on the electric guitar. I will come back to this in the electric video. But for now, just think of a B7 chord. And play string five three times. 
string four, back to string five, and then moving the middle finger over to the sixth string, second fret, quick pull down bend. Open E. Now if you were really looking to play it as a lead intro, you wouldn't necessarily hold down the whole chord. I would separate the notes, but I want you to visually be able to connect these two notes. The second fret of the A string and the first fret of the D string with the familiar B7 shape. And the bend, pretty small. It doesn't have to be. It's a gesture more than a specific aiming for that note. So it's a quick pull and release. So if it's this much, or this much, or this much, the effect is similar anyway. So the intro is basically one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So now take a look. When I say 12 bar blues, I should qualify this by saying that since we're counting this in two and not in four, we actually end up with twice as many bars. So I'll go through it counting it as if it were in four, but keep in mind we're looking at it as one and a two E and a one and a two E and a for the sake of making the rhythm part easier to understand. But I'm counting it in four this time so you catch the 12 bar blues aspect, or really 11 bar blues. So we do this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and the verse is one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, a, two, three, four, two, two. Three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, B seven, two bars, and E one, two, three, four, and that's it. So that's the eleventh bar. You might notice that I'm varying the bass notes as well. On the A chord, the bass is going from string five to string six. E chord is back to six, five. On the B7, we're going from the fifth string, that middle finger note here, to the sixth string by moving that middle finger note over, still to the second fret. Now there's more that we can do in terms of those bass notes, but I want to keep it simple for right now. So I'm going to play the intro and then the entire form of a single verse. One, two, one, two, three, four. Sunshine since I don't know when, but I'm stuck in Folsom Prison. Time keeps dragging on, but that train keeps rolling on down to San Antonio. Two, three, four. Next verse begins right there. So I don't really need to go beyond that right now. As I said, I'm going to follow this up with another video a little bit down the road that's going to get into the electric guitar parts and some more of the details. This is meant to be a basic overview, an introduction to the song. As I said before, this Essential Song series really is meant for beginners and it's a way to get you into building a vocabulary of classics that pretty much everybody who plays the guitar well is likely to know. It'll serve you well at jam sessions, it'll serve you well at parties when the guitars come out, and as I said, it's not meant to be a 100% accurate transcription so much as an introduction to the chords, the feel, the rhythm, the basic technique. So again, as I said, be on the lookout for the follow-up video. I'm Dave Isaacs, coming to you from the Guitar Studio on Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for watching.